three stocks, the April 2019 edition. Let's get started. What's up, everybody? My name is Ala, and welcome to my world of stocks. By the way, I left timestamps for you down below. All I ask is that you please hit the like button if you enjoy the video. It really helps the channel survive and grow, and I really appreciate it. And just really quick, in case you're new to the series, I just want to let you know that this is the monthly series where I talk about three different stocks every single month, and it's a very difficult thing to do, so please always do your own research and make your own decisions. I'm not telling anybody to buy or sell anything. I'm just giving a long-term kind of bullish thesis on some different stocks, and then if you find them interesting, then you can uh, research them further and just kind of go from there. But with all that said, let's go ahead and start with stock number one. All right, guys, stock number one, we've got AbV, ticker symbol A. BBV. And this is a company that I actually really like because of two primary reasons. One is that they have a very fair valuation, in my opinion. And reason number two is that they have a really nice big dividend. Uh, but let's go ahead and start by taking a look at the company and seeing what they do. Now, this is a biopharmaceutical company. And right away, that's the biggest reason why I've never invested in them myself. Uh, you guys know me. I don't usually invest in a company that sells a product or operates in a market that I either don't use or don't fully understand. But you guys might be well versed with the pharmaceutical industry, so uh, we'll just go ahead and continue with the video anyway. Now, AbbVie does both research and actually develops and sells various pharmaceutical products that offer care in dermatology, oncology, virology, neurological uh, disorders, gastroenterology, and so on. These products also treat a wide variety of conditions and diseases, ranging from autoimmune diseases, different types of cancers, different types of viruses like HIV or hepatitis C, and they even treat Parkinson's as well as several other conditions. Now, if you take a look at the stock, you can see that they've actually been dropping quite a bit lately. Don't get me wrong, they are still technically up by almost 50% in the past five years, but have since dropped by 26% from their 52-week high of over $107 per share to now trading as low as the $70 range. This poor performance has even carried over into 2019, where they are down by over 13% year to date, at a time when most stocks have been climbing by enormous amounts. A big part of this is likely due to one of their drugs called Humira, which by the way is the number one largest selling pharmaceutical product in the world, losing its patent in a few years from now in the United States. Another concern is that one of their cancer treatments called Rova-T saw clinical failure last year, which has turned into a major hurdle for the company and a drag on earnings, which we'll look at in just a second. Still, many analysts feel that much of this negativity is overblown as the company still has many other successful drugs either already generating enormous revenue or will begin to in the near future, with a few of them still being in the early stages of regulatory approval. In any case, the significant drops in share price have led to a very attractive valuation and an enormous dividend. While their trailing PE is still a bit high at over 21, their forward PE is dramatically lower at less than 9, and when factoring in future growth, their PEG ratio is rock solid at less than 1. Turning to their dividend, they have a monstrous forward yield of over 5.3%, a payout ratio that is a little higher than 50%, which I generally like it to be less than 50, but uh, even at this level, it's still pretty good. And they have a fantastic five-year growth rate of over 17% with six years of growth. Now, you may be thinking that six years of growth is very little, but you have to remember that that's when they started paying it, since they were technically spun off from another company called Abbott Laboratories, who's been paying dividends for decades, so this is by all accounts a company that is very dedicated to not only paying great dividends, but also increasing them at a very high rate, making it a very solid dividend growth stock as well. And you guys know how much I love to invest in dividend growth stocks. And speaking of growth, in 2018, they grew adjusted EPS by over 41% and revenues by over 15%, bringing in over $32 billion in sales. The fourth quarter was a little worse and failed to meet expectations as they actually saw a loss in gap net income, but that was mostly due to a write-off because of a 2016 acquisition related to the clinical failure of their Rova-T cancer treatment that we talked about earlier in the video. But when adjusting their numbers, they still saw adjusted EPS climb over 
and revenues climbed by over 8%. So again, pharmaceutical stocks are not really my cup of tea, but if they were, I really think that Abby would be one of my top choices. I mean, I really do like them a lot, and there's a few reasons for that. Uh, again, the fair valuation, I think it's a really good valuation. I think it's a really nice dividend. I mean, as a dividend growth stock, it feels pretty much um, like any any uh, criteria that I have for, for investing in a dividend growth stock. And then uh, reason number three is that they're still growing earnings and sales as well. So I do think that that dividend will continue to grow in the long term as well. So again, Abvi, pretty good looking stock. And uh, if I become a little more knowledgeable about the pharmaceutical industry, I think I might actually invest in them. But anyway, that was stock number one. Let's now transition to stock number two. All right, guys, moving on to stock number two. Uh, we're actually gonna go with a marijuana related company. Now, I get asked all the time what my favorite weed stocks are, and my favorite is probably Aurora Cannabis, but I also really like Canopy. And so for stock number two, I actually, you know, uh, let me just say this really quick. I think a lot of weed stocks have very high valuations, but they also have explosive growth. So I really do like weed stocks. I just feel that they're just too expensive when you look at their valuations. So a little bit of a safer pick for me would be something like Constellation Brands, ticker symbol STZ. And the reason why I like them is because uh, they're a one of the biggest alcohol beverage companies out there, but they also have a huge stake in uh, Canopy Growth, which we'll look at in a second, but it's like 38% stake in Canopy, which is also one of my favorite weed stocks or weed companies. And, uh, and then they also have the option to become a majority stakeholder in the next few years. So those are pretty big deals. Now taking a look at the stock, I think it's pretty reasonable at the moment. Uh, I personally would like it to drop a little bit more before I decide to jump in. But looking at the past five years, it's up over 100%. But more interestingly, it's actually been dropping since 2018, which is actually common across the alcohol industry as more people are moving away from commercial type of beers to niche market uh, craft beers and you can see that like with Coors you can see that with like Anheuser-Busch you know their stocks have been really struggling uh in kind of recent history but uh anyway back to uh STZ they're actually down over 25 percent in the past year and it's much closer to their 52 week low rather than their 52 week high currently trading in the 160 dollar range Thankfully, this does give them a more attractive valuation and dividend as they have a trailing PE of just around 10 and a trailing PEG of just 0.15. I'd have to take a look at that one, but man, that's really low. Uh, although to be fair, it looks like analysts are expecting the company to struggle in the near future as their forward PE jumps up all the way to over 18 and their PS and PB ratios are both pretty high as well. Still, their dividend doesn't look too bad. I know it's a little low with just a 1.75% yield and only three years of growth, but their payout ratio is only 33%, which I think is pretty reasonable. And according to Seeking Alpha, they've increased that dividend every year uh, since they've been paying it with a three-year growth rate of about 44%. So that's a very nice growing dividend that may actually be in its early stages uh, and possibly continue to grow if they can actually grow earnings. Well, when looking at the past five fiscal years, they grew revenues every single year to over $7.5 billion in their last fiscal year, although that was only growth of around 3 or 4%, but net income did climb by over 50%. And then looking at their last reported quarter, they grew sales by 9%. And while gap EPS did drop by 36%, which is obviously a big negative, adjusted EPS actually climbed by 18% with operating and free cash flows increasing by 34 and 77% respectively. That's pretty damn high. Uh, most importantly, their beer segment is doing extremely well despite the overall market being weak. Shipment volume jumped 14% and net sales jumped a very impressive 16%. They also noted that their Mo uh, Modelo and Corona beer products achieved the highest market share gains in the entire industry for the quarter in the United States. That's a big deal. By the way, Modelo, Corona, and Pacifico are all owned by Constellation, and those are some really high selling beers. I know this is a little like anecdotal, well, it's actually very anecdotal, but almost all of my Hispanic friends love those brands, and Modelo itself is actually one of my personal favorite beers to drink. So I know I'm a little biased in saying this, but I really think that those are some very popular uh, beer brands that are not gonna disappear anytime soon, especially 
uh, Corona and Modelo, and especially Modelo. I'm a really big fan of Modelo. Not to mention that they also recently launched Corona Premier, and if you've never heard of that, it's like a low calorie, low carb uh, beer, and that's kind of targeting like a little bit of a niche market, but it's a high growth market as well. A lot of people are trying to get kind of more low carb, uh, low calorie beers. So that's, a, and it looks like it's doing very well also. Uh, having said that, the, the legacy part of their business that is really struggling is their wine and spirits segment, which saw flat shipments and sales. But the good news is that there are reports of Constellation being in talks to sell around $2 billion worth of its low end wines. This extra cash could help them pay down debt, which by the way, Constellation has a ton of it. In fact, it's one of the reasons why I still haven't invested in them myself is because of all that debt. They, they only have around $3.6 billion in current assets, but they have 3.3 billion in current liabilities, which is like, you know, almost equal to their current assets. But then on top of that, they have a massive $11 billion in long-term debt. That is, that's really scary. That's a lot of debt. Uh, but to be fair, they do also have total assets of almost 28 billion, but I mostly look at current assets because I feel like it's more uh, tangible, it's more liquid. So that's really what I usually look at when I analyze a balance sheet. So um, it doesn't really do much to alleviate my worries. I'm still really concerned about all that debt. Either way, the extra cash can also be invested in more uh, more growth initiatives like the marijuana industry. Now, as far as I know, they've already spent $4 billion to acquire 38% of Canopy Growth, which is one of the most popular, if not the most popular weed company out there. And they also have warrants that they can use to buy a majority stake in the next couple years. Now there's two ways that I think Constellation will benefit from this. One is through the marijuana industry itself, thanks to the investment in Canopy, and the other is through cannabis-infused beverages. Well, starting with the former, we already know that the US cannabis retail market is expected to grow to over $18 billion in the next few years, with most of that coming from the recreational side, as 10 states have already legalized recreational use, and 30, uh, 33 states have legalized medical use. Uh, and while it's still illegal at the federal level in the United States, Canada, on the other hand, has already legalized marijuana use, uh, kind of like at the national level, and their market is estimated to be worth between 4.9 to 8.7 billion Canadian dollars by next year. So that's a pretty, pretty big market. Uh, keep in mind that Canopy is already one of the marijuana leaders in the country with revenue growth of close to 300% in their last quarter, which is insanely high growth. And while that was only around 83 million Canadian dollars, Constellation's new CEO mentioned during their last conference call that they expect Canopy to reach a $1 billion revenue run rate within the next 18 months. That would obviously be huge for both companies involved. And when looking at uh, cannabis infused drinks, that market could be worth over half a billion dollars in a couple years just in the United States alone. Now there's a couple things to note here. For one, legalization or legislation is still just kind of all over the place. Even in Canada where marijuana is legal, I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that edibles and drinks are still illegal uh, because I think that they're still going through the approval process. And in the US, it's like even worse because there you have the whole state versus federal issue. And not to mention that there's even different types of cannabis like infused products that you can make because you can make THC infused, which by the way, you know, THC is kind of like what gives you the high feeling. And then there's CBD infused and CBD is like the more uh, medicinal kind of side of marijuana where it's like uh, anti-anxiety. And there's like a lot of studies going around that like CBD oil is like really healthy and stuff. So like me personally, I don't, I don't really smoke marijuana, but um, I would be kind of interested in like CBD infused products. That would be, uh, you know, sounds kind of cool to me. And on the bright side, hemp is now, uh, I believe legal to farm in the US. I think it just, it needs to have like less than 0.3% THC, which I guess would make it more like CBD. But anyway, the point is that like legislation is just kind of all over the place right now. But I think that we can all pretty much agree that uh, legalization of marijuana is pretty much the future that we're heading towards, not just in the US, but also globally as well. And so that's a huge market out there. Now, I understand weed stocks, uh, you know, a ton, a ton of growth, but they also trade at like ridiculous valuations. So I understand people not wanting to invest in weed stocks, but you look at a company like Constellation Brands, if you can look past that huge debt that they have, which I can't really <laughs> look past, it kind of bothers me a lot. But, but uh, you know, if you kind of look past that and you look at it as a long-term investment, Constellation Brands looks really appealing because the valuation isn't that bad. And the fact that they're working so closely with Canopy, they might actually, you know, become majority holder of Canopy, they can help Canopy 
get through all the regulatory like hurdles, everything that uh, Can Canopy has to go through, because Constellation is this huge, huge company as well. Um, and on top of that, Constellation will also, also benefit from the growth of Canopy, and Constellation can also make cannabis-infused beverages. So it's just, it's a really good partnership in my opinion. So that's why I really like Constellation. Um, having said that, I still haven't invested in them yet. They're going to be reporting earnings in a couple weeks. If those earnings are weak and the stock gets dragged down even lower, I think at that point I would start considering, uh, for me personally, I would start considering an investment as a long-term investment. But again, my horizon has to be very long-term because I think that market has a ton of potential in the future. Uh, and I, I don't think Constellation Brands is going to go anywhere. I don't think Canopy is going to disappear either. So I really just think it's a good matchup. And, uh, and, and the other good thing too is that Constellation pays a, a pretty nice dividend as well. So that kind of makes it easier to hold kind of for the long term, waiting for those long term gains to really start pouring in. And all the meanwhile, you know, Constellation is having some pretty good success with their uh, beers and things like that too. So anyway, that's just kind of how I feel about that one, but let's go ahead and move on to stock number three. All right, guys, now for stock number three, I have to give you a, a little bit of an apology because uh, this one, I'm not as bullish on this one, uh, but I still wanted to include it this month because a lot of you have been like begging me to talk about this one and a lot of you are also invested in it. And it's a very high growth uh, stock, high growth company. It's, I'll, I'll just say it's Roku, ticker symbol R-O-K-U. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't believe in them. I, I'm just worried that they have too much competition. So I'm just giving you this quick disclaimer. In my opinion, Roku is a, a very much so a speculative stock, but it's also a very high growth stock. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's a bad stock. I just think that they have a lot of competition and you have to really, really, really do a ton of research before you even consider this one as an investment, in my opinion. But uh, with that said, I do still have uh, some bullish opinions on the company, so let's just kind of look at everything right now. Okay, looking at their stock, we can see that it's been very volatile since they IPO'd, but are still up over 140%, and they've definitely seen some huge dips along the way with some very large rallies as well. Most recently, they actually had a pretty big drop of over 20% in a two-day span on March 12 and 13, thanks to a couple of downgrades that we'll talk about a little bit later in the video. But they are still trading much closer to their 52-week high rather than their low, and currently sit at around $63 per share. Now, historically, Roku mostly sold standalone devices that you connect to your television, and it lets you stream video content through applications like Netflix, Hulu, or Amazon Video, essentially turning your TV into a smart TV. But over time, Roku has diversified themselves by offering their Roku platform as an operating system already integrated into smart TVs, hence the branding of so-called Roku TVs. And these are commonly sold by retailers in partnership with various TV makers like TCL, Sharp, Hisense, and more. I myself actually use a TCL Roku TV that I purchased from Amazon.com. However, this is where we run into our first problem with the business, and that's that they operate in a very competitive market. Amazon themselves partner with TV makers like Toshiba and Insignia to make Fire TV editions of their smart TVs. And they also sell standalone devices like their Fire Cube and Fire Stick, while other giant companies like Apple and Google sell very similar products as well. And it's this intense competition that recently led to a couple analyst downgrades, one of which was Loop Capital, who gave them a sell rating with a price target of just $45. They noted that the stock had already climbed by over 130% in less than three months into the new year, while Netflix only gained 33%, the FANG stocks gained 21%, and the S&P 500 gained 11%. They also stated that Roku faces too much heavy competition to justify the rich valuation, which I kind of agree with myself. Speaking of which, they currently have a market cap of over $7 billion without being profitable, and they still trade close to 10 times their sales and close to 30 times their book value. That is extremely high. However, Roku's earnings report paints a different picture of explosive growth. In their last quarter, active accounts grew by 40% year over year to 27 million, streaming hours grew by 69%, average revenue per user grew by 30%, Platform revenue grew by 77%, uh, which is really their most important segment because it's more diversified rather than relying on just their own physical players. 
but even player revenue itself also grew by 21% and total revenue grew by a massive 46%. So that those are a lot of different percentages of a lot of different growth for uh, different parts of their business. And while net income did drop very slightly by just around 2%, they were still profitable in the quarter by almost $7 million. They were, however, negative for the year, but they still saw dramatic improvements as net income went from a massive loss of over $63 million in 2017 to just about $9 million in 2018, with revenues growing by a massive 45%, so they are at least improving by a very large amount. And they expect the sales growth to continue into 2019 as they were guiding for revenue of over $1 billion, which would be another major increase of somewhere around 35% or more. Also, don't forget that they have a pretty solid balance sheet with over $432 million in current assets, which is almost double all of their liabilities combined. So that's pretty good. And while their market, <laughs> by the way, that's a huge contrast to what we saw in, uh, in Constellation Brands. But anyway, while their market is becoming more competitive, it's also very high growth. Now, it's difficult to give exact figures on the total market size because it can really be broken down in several different ways. But according to Statista, the subscription video on demand market alone is estimated to reach almost $25 billion in revenue this year. That's an increase of around $5 billion from just 2017. And while Roku certainly makes a lot of money in fees from allowing streaming services like Netflix and Hulu to be on its platform, they also generate a ton of the revenue from advertisements that they either push themselves, which is evident in their free Roku channel that is ad supported, or they get a cut from other services that support themselves by monetizing with ads. And so this is another area where we continue to see huge numbers. In fact, according to IAB's Internet Advertising Revenue Report, Digital ad revenue grew by over 20% year over year in 2017. That is insane growth when you consider that the raw total was almost $90 billion and has most likely passed $100 billion by now. And if you think that's crazy, Statista also estimates that digital ad spending will be over $300 billion this year and increase to over $500 billion by 2023. For context, Roku only did uh, less than $1 billion in revenue in all of last year. Now, of course, there are some major asterisks to this. For one, we can't really look at the digital ad market as a proper gauge for uh, Roku's potential because that market is really dominated by Google and Facebook. And a lot of that growth is really happening in social media and mobile advertising, which are two areas that I'm pretty sure Roku has like almost no presence in. However, that doesn't change the fact that we're still seeing a decline in traditional like cable television because of the whole cord cutting movement, uh, while we're seeing an increase in subscription video on demand uh, services, and we're also seeing an increase in digital ad spending and revenue. Those are all things, that, like those three things, those are all things that Roku should stand to benefit from. Also, in their last earnings call, Roku mentioned that they are investing heavily in international growth, which is an area that they haven't really tapped into, and they expect to see uh, international account growth uh, starting like by 2020. And, uh, and then that will be followed by like further monetization after that point. So if, you know, here's a scenario. If Roku heads into the next couple of years and is still seeing growth, right? If we, if Roku still sees growth in 2019 and 2020, and then at the same time, you still have the international market in your back pocket, that's a huge asset to Roku. They could potentially have, you know, still have a lot of growth here, like in the US. And then in the future, when the growth kind of starts to slow down, they could have the international market kind of step in and help offset that. So there is potentially a scenario where Roku does end up performing very well in the future. My biggest concern is that huge competition. I just can't ignore it. And, uh, you know, I, I can never, I can, I can almost never bring myself to invest in a company that has to go against Amazon, Google, and Apple. That is like, that is such a scary market to be in. So, and that's really where Roku is. And that's really where those companies want to be in as well. So it's just too hard for me to ignore that. For that reason, I can't invest in Roku. But, you know, if I was to ignore that, you know, if it, if it was a market where Roku didn't really have to worry about that huge competition, man, you know, Roku would, would be kind of a no-brainer because their, their growth rates are like insanely high. But
But who cares what I think, guys? I'd love to hear what you think. Are you interested in Roku as a growth investor? Are you interested in Constellation Brands as a marijuana investor? Or maybe you are interested in Abvi as more of like a pharmaceutical kind of industry uh, investor, or maybe even as a dividend growth investor, because it's also a pretty good dividend stock as well. I'd love to hear all your thoughts. Make sure you leave them down below. If you like the channel, please hit the like button. It really helps support uh, the channel. It really helps the channel survive and grow. Uh, it really helps the video as well. So anyway, I think that's about it. So thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.